are the Afro-Cubans? What role did they play in the development of Cuba? What is their present condition? Welcome to the Sankofa Pan-African series. Please support us through Patreon and by buying me coffee. Don't just subscribe to this channel. Turn on your notification button. Share our videos and check out our website, sankofastorybooks.com, for history, Afrocentric stories, and other resources for children. Afro-Cubans are Cubans of African ancestry. According to a 2012 national census that surveyed the 11.2 million Cuban population, one million described themselves as Afro-Cuban or Black, while three million considered themselves to be a mulatto or mestizo. This shows that about 4 million Cubans at the time of that census had some African ancestry. One of the most interesting things about the Afro-Cuban population is the fact that most of them still trace their origins to specific African ethnic groups or regions in Africa. While the largest proportions identify as being Yoruba, Akan, Arara, or Congo ethnic origins, there are also those who identify as being of Igbo, Efik, Ibibio, Kalabari, Ijo, Mandingo, Kisi, Fula, Makwa, and other African ethnic groups. So, how did they get there? Well, the first enslaved Africans were taken to Cuba in 1513. Like in other places in South America and the Caribbean, which were invaded by Europeans, many of these first Africans were forced to replace the rapidly decimated indigenous people, like the Taino Arawak. As in Hispaniola, almost as soon as they got there, enslaved Africans fought tooth and nail to escape slavery by forming resistance uh, groups. The first recorded uprising of enslaved Africans in Cuba was in 1533 at the Jababo Mines. From then on, there were frequent uprisings and those of them who escaped made their way into the mountains where they coexisted with the surviving indigenous Taino groups to form independent African Maroon settlements called Palenques. The Palenques were their strongholds from which they mounted raids on Spanish settlements. After mining came to an end in Cuba, Cuba remained an important trade route in the New World because of the location, because of its location on the Windward Passage linking the North Atlantic Ocean and the Caribbean Sea. So gold, um, silver, emeralds from Spanish mining centers in Bolivia, Peru and Mexico was shipped to Spain through Havana, which had then become the capital of Cuba. Havana was also given the monopoly to serve as the only port that could ship goods to Spain. As such, between the 16th and 17th centuries, Havana's prosperity as a major port meant that there was little interest both in mining and the plantation system. Uh, um, as such, the number of enslaved uh, people needed was not that high. So they did not need that many enslaved people. They were mostly needed to work loading and offloading ships and um, working as shipbuilders, carpenters, uh, stone masons, domestic servants, and shop assistants. By the late 1700s, however, 
after the British took um, the prospering Havana over from Spain during the Seven Years' War and occupied both the city and the port, they brought in 10,000 Africans within less than 10 months because the British needed them to work in the uh, sugar factories we had uh, now established. The Spanish wrested Havana back from the British in 1763, and by 1789, they turned the Havana port into one of the largest gateways for the buying and selling of enslaved Africans. The Africans continued to mount their resistance from the Payenkes, and in 1796, the Spanish organized militia groups to hunt down the freedom fighters and destroy the Payenkes. As a result of the so-called um, Royal Decree of Graces of um, 1815, which was passed by the Spanish crown, Spaniards and other European settlers flooded in to populate the colonies of Cuba and Puerto Rico. The decree encouraged the use of slave labor to revive agriculture, and, and this helped create a new planter class which needed large numbers of enslaved Africans. This then caused the African population to grow to more than 40% of the population by 1840. As Cuba became the world's largest sugar producer, Havana became the largest market for enslaved Africans in the Caribbean. As a result, uprisings continued across Cuba throughout the 1830s. Even after the prohibition of the transatlantic uh, slave trade, Africans continued to be sold into slavery in Havana's market until 1867. Another reason uh, for the deliberate attempt to encourage uh, Europeans to settle in, uh, in Cuba was the large population of Africans during the 19th century, which prompted a call for European uh, emigration to counterbalance the effect. In other words, they wanted the European um, population to overwhelm, to be greater than the number of black people in Cuba. Although Cubans became the last Caribbean territory to abolish slavery in 1886, Afro-Cubans continued to suffer oppression, segregation, and exclusion. However, in spite of racial discrimination, Afro-Cubans believed that an independent Cuba would usher in a better life for them so, like in other places in the New World, they were the backbone of the Cuban Liberation Army. They played a prominent role in the War of Independence um, between 1895 and 1898. Even senior ranks of the Liberation Army were filled with Afro-Cuban war heroes like Antonio Maceo. Unfortunately, their dreams did not materialize because segregation became even more compounded in Cuba in 1898 with the occupying armed forces of the United States, which refused to recognize Cuba's independence. Rather than alleviate the conditions of Afro-Cubans, the U.S. institutionalized racial discrimination by segregating blacks and whites in educational, um, economic, cultural, and recreational establishments. And although the Constitution of 1901 
guaranteed formal equality for all Cubans, a policy of black yamento whitening was put in place and 400,000 new Spanish immigrants were invited to settle in Cuba between 1902 and 1919, thereby effectively turning the country into the largest Spanish population in Latin America. Many attempts were also made by Spanish missionaries to convert Afro-Cubans to Catholicism, but they resisted and continued to practice their own religions and also by mixing their belief with the ones imposed by the Catholic colonizers. Santeria, also known as, known as a Lukumi, derived from the Yoruba word Olukumi or Regla de Ocha, evolved in Cuba during the late 19th century. Santeria developed through a process of syncretism between the traditional Yoruba religion and the Catholic form of Christianity. It, evolved, it revolves around deities called Orisha, which have equivalents in Catholic saints. The Orisha in Santeria or Lukumi derive their names and characteristics from traditional Yoruba divinities. Afro-Cuban religions like Santeria, as well as their artistic expressions, were perceived as threats to Cuban identity because the colonizers wanted Cuba to remain white and European. As such, they passed decrees to stop Afro-Cubans from practicing their religion, and their leaders were falsely accused of kidnapping and killing white children uh, for rituals. They were even banned from drumming, dancing, or even gathering. The issue of race in Cuba is a most complicated one because although the U.S. successfully installed the dictator uh, Batista, a white-skinned man of mixed ethnicity. Even during his presidency, non-whites were still repressed and the Batista period was especially hard on uh, Afro-Cubans. Their religion, which had always served them as a source of strength, was made illegal. It wasn't until the afro Cubanismo movement uh, valorized the influence of African culture, that blackness was acknowledged as an integral part of the Cuban national identity. After the 1959 revolution led by Fidel Castro, the country outlawed all forms of formal discrimination and institutional racism, and attempts were made to put economic and social reforms in place. Cuba also became supportive of independent movements in several African countries. However, the colonial racist system did not end with the revolution. The lighter-skinned Cuban population still looks down on dark-skinned Cubans as subordinate or second-class citizen. Colorism is still prevalent and race plays a role in Afro-Cubans' access to education, which in turn impacts their um, socio-economic mobility. Afro-Cubans live in the poorest areas and can't access higher education because they don't have as much access to American dollars or tourism as white Cubans. The various um, embargoes which the U.S. insists on placing on Cuba has left Cubans dependent 
on their exiles in the U.S. because they need U.S. dollars in order to buy food and to go to school. And not a lot of uh, Afro-Cubans actually are able to make their way into the U.S. and then be able to send um, U.S. dollars to, to their people back home, unlike their white counterparts. Thanks for watching. Please support us through Patreon and by buying me coffee so we can continue to bring you this series. Subscribe if you have not yet done so. Please turn on your notification buttons and don't forget to share our videos with all your contacts. And then keep your comments coming.